So in today's installment of me reading out tweets from Michael Burry, in this video I'll talk about a couple of recent tweets where he has attacked the Federal Reserve, and I'll talk about the underlying logic behind his comments here, and they're basically pertaining to two different things. One, insider trading essentially, and also two, inflation. And I'll unpackage both of these, because both of them have a degree of sense to them, the insider trading one probably more so than the inflation one, because to my mind the inflation comments are to some extent analogous to the difference between normal inflation and core inflation, which I'll get to when I get to that inflation related tweet. But with any of these, do let me know if you have any thoughts about Michael Burry's tweets or anything else you'd like me to cover. So with that out of the way, let's have a look at what Michael Burry was saying. So the first tweet that I'll talk to is primarily pertaining to what I would refer to as being insider trading or analogous there too. Basically pertaining to Fed Reserve insiders being able to sell shares or buy shares in stocks that would be impacted by their decisions. Now, in essence, that could be any stock, but nevertheless, stocks that could be impacted by their decisions. So in his tweet, he is saying, cute timing for an ethics outcry to force Fed governors to sell stocks. Too cute by half. Now, that's what the tweet says. We can look at the article, and the article is basically pertaining to this. So I'll just go briefly through what the article is saying. So the article that Michael Burry was linking to is in the New York Times. Now, New York Times is paywalled, but it's able to press Control P to get the article before the paywall kicked in. So I said here, Fed official trading draws outcry and fuels calls for accountability. Central Bank regional presidents traded securities in markets in which the Fed cho uh, choices mattered in 2020. Here's why critics find that troubling. Fed Reserve officials traded stocks and other securities in 2020, a year in which the central bank took emergency steps to prop up financial markets and prevent their collapse, raising questions about whether the Fed's ethics standards have become too lax and its role vastly expanded. The trades appear to be legal and in compliance with Fed rules. Million-dollar stock transactions from the Dallas Fed president, Robert S. Kaplan, have drawn particular attention, but none took place when the central bank was most actively backstopping financial markets in late March and April. However, the mere possibility that Fed officials might be able to financially benefit from information they learn through their positions has prompted criticism of perceived shortcomings in the institution's ethics rules, which were forged decades ago and are now struggling to keep up with the central bank's 21st century function. What we now have is an ethics system built in a very narrow conception of what central banks should be, said Peter Conte Brown, a Fed historian at the University of Pennsylvania. On Thursday, Mr. Kaplan and Eric Rosengren, president of the Federal Reserve Bank of Boston, said they would sell all of the individual stocks they own by September 30 and move their financial holdings into passive investments. While my financial transactions conducted during the early years, during my years as Dallas Fed president, have complied with the Federal Reserve's ethics rules to avoid even the appearance of any conflict of interest, I have decided to change my personal investment practices, Mr. Kaplan said in a statement. He added, there will be no trading in these accounts as long as I am serving as president of the Dallas Fed. Now, the article continues on rather like this, so I won't go through the whole article. In short, Michael Burry, I, pe I believe, has a point here. Essentially, it is the concern that there's either insider trading or the appearance thereof. Now, I don't want to make any allegations about the individuals involved. It appears they have not done anything illegal, and they have fully complied with the ethics guidelines in question. However, when we've got a situation where central banks could easily influence inflation, and inflation affects literally every stock or asset class in the economy, then there's a clear position where they could benefit from the decisions they are making, and they could decide when they could either buy shares or sell shares. So by the same type of logic as the president ideally putting his or her financial assets into a blind trust, having them managed by someone else, you would think the same might apply to some of the Federal Reserve presidents. The main thing that would offset this to me is Federal Reserve presidents are not necessarily paid that much. So if you want to induce people to take that position, you can't very well crunch their ability to make money elsewhere. And I think that would make the position much less attractive to some individuals. Nevertheless, I can see Michael Burry's point here. It certainly is a concern that Federal, Federal Reserve officials could make decisions that would be premised on the idea of how they will benefit their stock portfolio as opposed to anything else. Now, Michael Burry, if we go back to the tweet, has made a specific statement about the need to sell those shares. That, cute timing for an ethics outcry to force the Fed governors to sell stocks. Too cute by half. He's getting the idea that he believes we are perhaps confronting the mother of all crashes, 
and therefore they'd be selling at the top of the market. So in fact, they are directly benefiting from decisions that he believes that they have made that would benefit themselves. So that's essentially what he's getting at here. I have a degree of sympathy for this, but I don't personally think there's going to be the mother of all crashes. I think the market might have slow growth, but without a catalyst, and the Evergrande situation could theoretically be a catalyst, but without a catalyst, I don't see there being a major market crash. So I don't necessarily agree with what he is saying right here. And Michael Burry has been calling crashes for quite some time. And if you call them long enough and often enough, you will eventually be right. But I don't necessarily see there as being a looming one necessarily, but that's a topic for another time. So that is the first tweet primarily pertaining to trading by government officials. So the second tweet pertains to inflation. And it says, regarding inflation, so Federal Reserve, are you lying to us or are you lying to us? And essentially what he is trying to get at here is the reporting of inflation data. So if we zoom in on what he is saying, this is an extract from a Wall Street Journal article. It says, Mr. Powell used a gauge from the Dallas Fed that throws out the top 31% and bottom 24% of personal consumption expenditure price changes and was bang on the Fed's 2% year-on-year target in July, the latest available. An alternative measure from the Cleveland's Fed strips out the top and bottom 16% of consumer price index changes and was far higher. Worse, the monthly rate was unchanged from August to July, giving no support for the idea that inflation is already coming back down. So what Michael Burry is getting at right here is that inflation, A, is malleable based on which figures you use, which is correct. We know this between the difference between normal inflation and core inflation, where core inflation strips out uh, things like commodities, oil and gas and the like. So you've already got that difference. But if you're further going the additional step of stripping out the things that you think have increased the most, then it's kind of like saying, well, inflation was great if we ignore the things that have increased a lot in price. So that's essentially what he's trying to get at here. And the idea that if you're stripping out a lot of those things, then maybe inflation can be pushed around to suit the narrative that you want. Now, I half agree with Michael Burry here. I half agree with his statement. Of course, he does make a valid point that if you play around with your statistics enough, you can get a number that is going to suit what you want. I have a PhD in finance, so I have observed myriad studies that have been botched and have been complete dumpster fires and have been designed in order to get the narrative that people want. However, the question then is, they might have adjusted the figures. Was there some logic or some reasoning behind this? So was there a good reason for tossing out those top and bottom portions? Now, 31% and 24% sound arbitrary. So I could not necessarily speak to whether there is a good reason for doing so. I would argue there is a good reason for adjusting for outliers. Every single time period, you're going to get some form of random outlier that has caused some massive spike. Those random outliers can be either significant spikes or significant negative tick start. Now, that could just be a quarter on quarter blip. It is worthwhile adjusting for those because if you make policy decisions based on temporary random blips, we're going to end up with both A, very volatile policy decisions, and also be potentially incorrect policy decisions that are being skewed by outliers. You don't want that to happen. However, when you're throwing out the top 31%, that's more than a quarter of the top, of the, of the inflation changes, sorry. So what that does suggest is they're cutting out more than just outliers. Now, we would need to full, see full details about exactly why the Federal Reserve justified this. I would not leap to conclusions necessarily that the Federal Reserve has manipulated data here because the Federal Reserve is a credible institution, to my mind anyway. But I think it is something that would be worthwhile them explaining in a little bit more detail about precisely why they tossed out what they did and why they chose one measure over another. And I want to be very clear here, the mere fact that the Cleveland Fed has a different measure from the Dallas Fed does not necessarily mean that one is better than the other. It is worthwhile seeing how the data fluctuates across the two measures, but it doesn't necessarily mean the Dallas Fed's measure was incorrect. So that is basically what he is saying about the Federal Reserve's inflation data right here. 
So that's essentially what we're seeing with these two tweets from Michael Burry and the attacks he's made in relation to the Federal Reserve. One of them pertains to ethics-related issues, particularly trading, where the Federal Reserve officials could hypothetically benefit from their trades. And I don't want to make any allegations about the individuals involved in that reporting. That's, however, what has been reported about the trades and the issues that might surround this and why people might have some issues with the credibility of some of the Federal Reserve officials when they could directly benefit from the decisions they are making. He's also making comments about the inflation data and how inflation data is all over the place, and it might not actually be the case that inflation has tamped down. The reason that's important is Michael Burry has previously warned us about significant amounts of inflation in the economy. So this is suiting Michael Burry's prior narrative that inflation is very high. To my mind, I think there's both some structural shifts up and some temporary issues. Some of the temporary changes, so for example, there are car price changes, which are quasi-temporary. I say quasi-temporary because you've got chip shortages, for example, driving up car prices. However, car manufacturers have already indicated they're going to keep prices high even after chip, sh chip shortages are resolved. So if prices have shifted up, reflecting the commodity price increases, then it kind of bakes in some of that inflation and it stops being a temporary blip and starts being more permanent. That's not to say it won't happen with everything. For example, steel prices might tick upwards, but they can tick back downwards. The car price issue that I just mentioned is not going to be constant across all commodities and all industries, but it is something that one does need to bear in mind. It won't necessarily just be a temporary tick. Now, that's essentially what we're seeing. The question, of course, is what the Federal Reserve would do about this. The Federal Reserve would be better off, to my mind, reporting more varied measures of inflation. This might confuse retail market participants in that if you've got a retail participant who is saying, oh, well, we've got this inflation measure and this inflation measure, what do we make of it? But sophisticated investors who, given the sheer amount of institutional investing in the market, are ultimately setting prices, should be able to interpret inflation data. And if you're working at a hedge fund and you can't interpret inflation data, you probably shouldn't be working at a hedge fund. So essentially, they benefit here from reporting more data and explaining in more detail why they make the decisions that they do to remove particular parts of the data. And in any case, that's a bit of a recap about Michael Burry's most recent comments about the Federal Reserve. If you have any thoughts about this, do let me know that in the comments below. Of course, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts as well. But otherwise, of course, it'd be great if you like the video and subscribe to the channel. And hopefully I'll see you for future videos as well. Bye.